My primary focus is going to be talking about intensive physical therapy, in particular the TheraSuit method of intensive therapy, um, which is what I've been trained in. It kind of goes along nicely what, with um, what they had talked about earlier, because we all kind of have some overlapping themes, which is basically intensity. Um, so when we're talking about intensive physical therapy, um, it's based on the physiological response of the body to exercise. Um, and when you're talking about intensity, you can be looking at the duration of the session, you can be looking at the challenge that you're presenting during the session, and also the frequency of the intervention. Um, some of the studies have shown that like adults, children should be physically active most, if not all days of the week. Um, experts suggest at least 60 minutes of moderate physical activity daily for most children. And in order for a person with or without a disability to increase his or her fitness level um, and therefore their functional mobility, they must exercise at an intensity and frequency that brings on supercompensation. So I'm going to talk about supercompensation for a second. Basically what it is, it's a, a peak physiological response. It causes the body to build extra energy in all of the body's systems, allowing the body to adapt with increased efficiency and shifting the body to a higher level of performance. Um, it's based on kind of Olympic athlete um, principles and that you're training and training and training and you're building these energy stores so that when you go to the next, um, the next day, you have this increased level of endurance to pull from. Um, the more intense the exercise, the more extra energy the, bed, the body will be able to store up for the next bout of exercise. And this kind of goes along with the fact that a child with a disability, um, I have listed here for example cerebral palsy, their peak physiological response is 50% less than a child without a disability, meaning that they need to learn, lo work longer to get the same response that a child. So if, a typical child could go run outside for 15 minutes and that would give them a, a good aerobic workout. The, the child with cerebral palsy would have to work longer than that to get the same effect. That's basically what that means. Um, Jill talked about motor control, motor learning. Um, and the question is, do the same motor learning, um, the principles um, apply to, ch uh, the decreased feedback apply to children? Um, she mentioned about an adult patient, it's, it's true. The children do not have as large of a frame of internal reference. A lot of the times the adults have already learned these skills and they're having to relearn them. But for a child, they don't know it yet, so it's harder. They don't know what to pull from. They also may need more feedback for longer um, to have successful motor learning. So um, research has shown that the ch children um, who have difficulties with motor learning and performance need to perform an activity thousands of times for it to be incorporated into their um, movement repertoire. Kind of like the football thing, um, football field that uh, Jill was talking about. There's also the ecological approach. Um, and that is basically the activity must be functional and meaningful to the child to promote motor learning, which is what Jill had touched on. Um, muscle groups and joints act as units and movements and are closely connected to the dynamic mechanical properties of these units. And the ecological approach is, is used um, with the TheraSuit method of intensive therapy. So your intervention strategies, you're looking at a natural environment. It should occur in natural everyday settings. Um, you want to create something that's going to be attractive to the child, um, respect their interests and in what you're selecting. And you want to promote opportunities for strengthening, coordinated use, and um, coactivation of muscles needed for function. Some of your strategies, you're going to be using specialized equipment and settings. Um, so if an individual has more physical challenges, they may need more specialized equipment. Um, and you may need to provide um, a different level of intensity in addition to specialized equipment. So some examples of intensive therapy programs, um, there's intensive manual therapy, there's intensive suit therapy, which is what I'm going to talk about, um, aquatic therapy, physical therapy, and neurodevelopmental therapy, and DT. So for the TheraSuit method of intensive physical therapy, a typical session is for three weeks, five days per week, three hours per day. And this type of intensive training session occurs three to four times per year. Um, following a typical intensive session, 
Um, it's recommended that the child participate in a maintenance program. Um, and this doesn't have to be done by a physical therapist. It can be overseen by a physical therapist, but it's actually recommended that um, it be done more in a home type setting with a parent or somebody caregiver with the child um, because you're going to be continuing strengthening exercises, stretching exercises and the functional activities that you worked on in the intensive program to help maintain what they had learned. So it doesn't have to be a physical therapist. Um, it can just kind of be followed by one. So talking about the rationale, where do you come up with the three hours per day, three weeks, five days per week? Um, three hours per day, um, you're attempting to kind of shift the body's homeostasis, homeostasis to perform at a much higher level. This kind of goes back to the concept of supercompensation where you're looking for that peak physiological response and it takes a longer time to get that. Um, and that's kind of been seen in today's presentations. There's this intensity of of um, increasing the amount of practice time that the child is, is participating. Um, why three weeks? Um, the studies that they have done so far on intensity, um, intensive therapy, um, when you're looking at the strength and neural factors, the most significant changes occur in the first three weeks. And um, the neural factors and strength factors affect motor learning and, um, multi and motor performance by increasing muscle activation. Um, they've shown in some of the cases that when you go beyond this, when you go to four or five weeks, then you start getting the principles of overtraining, which is then going to, is not what you want. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cause a regression. Why five days per week? Um, by performing the more frequent and intense sessions, you see improvements in performance because of the sum of training effects. Um, and again, as with the Rationale for three weeks, it also noted that if you have a maximal intensity stimuli that you keep applying, you can see a decline, which is related to the overtraining principle. So we're going to talk about equipment. Um, part of the intensive therapy TheraSuit method is a dynamic trunk orthosis. Um, the TheraSuit is what's up here, and I can leave this up here if you guys want to come up afterwards and kind of play around with it and see what it's about. Um, it's got a vest, shorts, knee pads, a headpiece, which she's not wearing because she needed to look good. Um, and, and I didn't want to scare anybody. <laughs> and there's a series of hooks that are used with um, latex-free rubber bands so that you're allowed to position the child's body in the most neutral alignment. The suit originated um, from the Russian astronauts because they were trying to find something that they could wear in space that would help load their bodies so they wouldn't, have, um, they wouldn't lose bone density while they were in outer space. And the first suit was developed in the 1970s. Um, by coincidence, a child with cerebral palsy who was using a reverse walker for ambulation was put in the suit. And after two weeks of wearing the suit for three to four hours a day, he was then able to walk without an assisted vice. So this where, that's where the idea kind of came as to, oh, well, let's see if we can um, come up with something that would work for the kids. Um, the ben benefits of the TheraSuit. This is where things went a little crazy. Um, okay, so retraining the central nervous system. I just mentioned that you're trying to get it into as close to a normal alignment as possible. Um, the vertical loading over hip joints, improving hip alignment, uh, normalizing muscle tone, Influencing the vestibular system because the vestibular system monitors tonicity, so your tone, and it can help normalize muscle tone, um, especially in children who have lower tone. Um, decrease uncontrolled movements in ataxia and athetosis. Improve body and spatial awareness. Support weak muscles. Improve bone density. Um, promote development of both fine and gross motor development. Um, it provides deep proprioception, which is not on your list. Um, pressure is crucial to the start of function of the nervous system. You need the loading and the experience. And improves speech production and fluency through head and trunk support. Mainly because of the way the suit and the way that you put the rubber bands, you're kind of having a pull on the diaphragm and the lower rib cage, which helps um, position the diaphragm better for the children so they're able to speak. Um, it's easier for them to, to produce vocalizations. Another type of dynamic trunk orthosis that can be used is a Benic suit. Um, it's made out of neoprene. It's flexible. Uh, it also increases proprioception. It's um, also been shown to help reduce tone and spastic and dystonic muscles. 
It can improve trunk control and posture and reduce involuntary movements. It does not supply, though, the same force and adjustability as the TheraSuit. Um, because with the rubber bands, you are afforded the opportunity to kind of get the muscles where you want, you know, where you want things. You don't have that much flexibility with the Benex suit. Theratogs is another um, uh, type of dynamic trunk orthosis. Um, it's for children with sensory motor impairments to improve their postural alignment stability, movement skill and precision, and joint stability. It's made from latex-free fabric. It has a foam lining, it's breathable, comfortable. Children typically can wear this under their clothing. Um, it has some elastic straps um, that can help to position the body similar to um, the Therasuit. Um, we have similar, uh, small world, we have some pictures with similar kids in it that we, that we both know. Um, talking about continuation of equipment, there is the universal exercise unit, which is that cage thing um, that we're kind of standing in. It's got a top, sides, and a back. Um, one thing that it's used for is, is pulleys. And this little girl is doing some strengthening exercises. So um, you're using the pulleys and weights that um, are allowing the therapist to isolate a particular movement and strengthen the muscle while gravity is eliminated. Um, which is very, which is typically difficult to do if you have a child who has high or low, high tone or low tone, using more um, traditional methods because it's difficult to isolate um, and get them to learn um, what it feels like to use that muscle that's um, that's weaker. Um, there have been a lot of studies done that have shown the effect that immobilization can have on muscle fiber development, which also which ultimately affects muscle strength. So if a mu muscle is not used, it's considered immobile, and the components of the muscle fiber will start to change. So typically we have these fiber types that are slow twitch fibers, which are endurance fibers. And what happens as the, the muscle becomes immobile, they kind of switch to a, a fast twitch fiber, which produces a lot of force but doesn't have a lot of endurance. And what they've been able to show is that the switch is not complete, um, that the child can gain kind of an intermediate fiber type, which has some endurance and some strength. So the goals of when you're using the pulleys is to promote independent movement, prevent muscle atrophies, improve muscle strength, increase range of motion, prevent joint contractures, and help to normalize muscle tone. The other thing that you use the cage for is what we call the spider. Um, and it's a series of dynamic elastic cords with a belt. Um, and typically the child is able to perform an independent movement while they're supported in this spider setup. It's often a continuation of the specific strengthening goals that you may have initiated in the pulley system. So if you're working on something while the child is on their back or on their belly or on their side, you can put, it in the, um, you can put them upright in the bungees and continue that activity. Transferred to it, it could be transferred to a more functional skill. Um, so the goals of exercise when you're in the spider to promote independent movement. So you're taking the concepts of stability, coordination, biomechanics, endurance, and balance because they're all related together, and they're all dependent on each other. You also want to um, have some strength and stabilization. The higher you put the cords in the cage the more support you're giving the child. The lower that you put the cords, the more resistance you're having them work against. Balance, the bungees provide support and stabilization so that the child can exer experience subtle movements that they could never experience before. Um, a lot of times when kids are in the bungees, this is their first time to kind of be standing independently without anybody's hands on them. So they get pretty excited and they'll start jumping or they'll start swaying back and forth. So it kind of gives them a chance to experience what it's like to not have somebody on you all the time. And also coordination. Um, because the bungees give the stabilization, they can perform a movement that's more precise and they can perform it with multiple repetitions to increase fluency of movement. Um, and it's been shown that increased time in an upright position can have a positive uh, influence on the vestibular system. Last thing is obviously you're working on functional skills and developmental my milestones. So you can begin with a child in a low position in the cage in the spider, like in a sitting or, or um, quadruped position and kind of move to kneeling or half kneeling, work on transitional movements until they're upstanding, working on single limb support or squatting. 
So a typical intensive session, the three-hour session, would consist of um, stretching, massage of tight, tight muscles, getting things ready, strengthening in the cage, um, putting on a TheraSuit or a different kind of trunk orthosis, and working on some functional activities on the floor, strengthening, and, and doing some of that same stuff in the spider. I'm going to talk a little bit just on bracing. Um, and I have some sample stuff up here, so if you want to come and check it out, you can also, um, these are things that have been really successful for me um, in helping with some of the difficulties with gait and stability. Um, the first is the SureStep Dynamic Stabilizing System. Um, it's an orthotic that helps control foot and ankle pronation in children with, present with low muscle tone. It also can work for children who don't have extremely high muscle tone. Um, it doesn't work very well for a child who's very spastic, but it can work for a child who has a little bit higher tone. Um, they use a thin, flexible plastic, and they use a compression technology, so they're actually holding the foot in a better alignment. Um, what's good about it is that, if you can see, it doesn't come all the way towards the toe, so the child is still able to go up onto their toes. They're still able to do jumping, running, squatting, which is not always easy when you're in a traditional AFO when you have no ankle bend, depending on how much assist they need. Um, the other thing that we're going to talk about is the kitty gate. Um, this is relatively new for kids in the past couple of years. Um, it is a carbon composite framework that you use in conjunction with something like a SureStep or with an SMO. Um, and what it does is it provides, because it's more of a dynamic system, it gives you more of a floor reaction type response. Um, it helps, helps with um, management of knee extension flexion moment. It also adds some lower um, leg anterior support and stability. Um, so some of the things, some of the benefits that they've seen are that there's a more functional heel-to-toe gait. Um, when you use it with um, the appropriate, you know, either SureStep or an SMO. It's more lightweight, so you have less brace um, to do the same work as traditional AFOs. It's got some anterior support that provides an opportunity, um, this part up here, for increasing the proprioceptive response. This particular foot plate gives kind of a spring assist. So if you have a child who has kind of like a toe drag or, or they don't really take a great step with this, this helps with that. Um, it, it's also great because you can use the SMO, like if you're in your therapy session and you want to work on some strengthening type stuff, and add the kitty gate in when you want to do more stability and dynamic walking. Okay, so this part makes me a little sad because there's a very great video of Henry who was walking with um, a um, sure step pullover which basically is a, um, a two-piece brace. It's basically the sure step SMO with a um, more traditional AFO and there's a proximal strut that can be removed. And so what you can do is you could have this part on and then when he needed more increased stability. Um, part of the problem that we were having with Henry is he was taking a, um, a step two gait with his right foot and he wasn't getting a forward step. And so we kind of experimented with the orthotist in using um, the kitty gait with, um, he has now, he's wearing a DAFO number four. So if you see Henry walking around, that's what the video was. Mm -hmm. And, and um, if you see him walking around, that's what he's wearing. It has significantly improved his balance and stability. Um, his gait is more normalized. He is picking up his right foot. He's not dragging it as much. So we're definitely, sorry you can't see the video, but if you want to see it on my computer, I'll show it to you. Um, it's just not here. Um, the other thing that everyone's probably familiar with is the traditional Cascade DAFOS dynamic ankle foot orthosis. Um, these are for biomechanical alignment. Um, it's custom made, usually help with foot positioning. Um, so some of the functional changes that are seen with an intensive therapy program are um, gross and fine motor, communication, cognition, social, emotional, and self-help. And I, I can't be specific as to which ones each child would have, um, but these are the changes that are seen. Benefits of intensive therapy kind of goes along with what we were all talking about, uh, the neuroplasticity causing the brain to create new pathways and reorganize. Acquisition of motor skills, neuroplasticity allows the neurons in the brain to compensate for injury and disease for acquisition of motor skills and improve other areas of development. 
Who's appropriate? Um, pretty much anybody. Um, cerebral palsy, status post-CVA, developmental delays, traumatic brain injury, ataxia, athetosis, hypertonia, hypotonia, and different kinds of neuro, you know, neurological and um, uh, syndrome, um, such as Down syndrome. So we're, we're the promote promoting the skilled physical therapy for guidance in the sense that we're trying to guide the information that goes into the nervous system. And it's important to assess each child's needs specifically um, as to what they may need. And hopefully you don't look like her um, at the end of this presentation, although you guys have probably had a long day. Um, so that's the end.